Test. Hello. Hello, George. Go on, Ed. Yeah, sorry about that. Fire with escape, no problem. Don't no worry. Yeah, okay. Uh, George, I've been provided with a list of questions by a Japanese journalist of Rock Magazine. Okay, yeah. well, just far away. Okay, yeah, so th there may be some inconsistencies because these are not my questions, but uh, bear up with me. Um, the sound of uh, cheapness and beauty uh, sounds a lot more aggressive, uh, sounds a lot more muscular than the last record. Um, muscular. Yeah, more, more powerful. Um, what exactly is, is this reflective of? What sort of changes have you been going through that account for, for that sort of thing? I think the album has more energy than anything I've done for a while because I'm feeling a lot more energetic, a lot more focused. But the album, although there are kind of more aggressive tones to it, you know, there's a lot of different shapes on the record. I mean, there's stuff with just vocals and acoustic guitar, there's stuff with 40 piece orchestra. And people seem to be focusing in on, on the kind of more guitar orientated stuff. Um, because I suppose I haven't really touched on that area before. But, um, you know, as I said in my bio, I kind of grew up with punk and Bowie and T-Rex. So, it's in a way going back to kind of the source, going back to the stuff I grew up with. Mm -hmm. uh, and I... but, it's, but it's also taking, you know, I mean, taking traditional music, but thinking about very untraditional issues. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess sound-wise, rather than more aggressive than before, it's more diverse. Well, I would like to think that all my music has been diverse. I mean, I've never really had a sound. I mean, you think of Madonna, the Pet Shop Boys, George Michael even, you know, they have a kind of distinctive sound. I've always been a bit of a kind of whore when it comes to music, you know. I, I'm always experimenting because I bore easily. You know, I mean, I, I, my idea of music is that it should always be, you know, kind of confrontational and challenging not only to yourself but also to the audience. Mm -hmm. I don't see it as some kind of market strategy. I'm not aiming to kind of please any particular audience. I'm starting by pleasing myself. And then anything above and beyond that is a kind of a surprise or a bonus. So we're to take it then that you, you already are bored of your become bored of the last uh, type of style you pursued to the, to the house stuff? Oh no, I mean, you know, there, there, will be, there will be dance mixes of these tracks. I mean, there is a dance mix of fun time. The great thing about technology is that no one has to really be limited anymore. I mean, if you take a band like U2, some of their finest work over the last two years have been the remixes of their records. The stuff that was done by Paul Oakenfold is like a big DJ here, mm -hmm. the remixes. So people are blending the kind of rock element with the dance element, and that is exciting. I mean, you know, there, there are no limitations anymore. I mean, that's, you know, that's the great thing about it, I think. You, you, you touched on uh, your roots a second ago. You mentioned David Bowie. Uh, how about this uh, this cover, cover of Fun Time? Uh, well, was, was Iggy Pop also uh, a hero of yours? Absolutely. I mean, Iggy, obviously, because he worked with Bowie, I mean, that's how I kind of got to know about Iggy. Um, and also, you know, people like Lou Reed as well, you know, through my kind of like love of David Bowie as a teenager, that kind of encouraged me to explore those other artists as well. Mm -hmm. And Nicky was obviously one of them, you know, and um, I think he's sort of one of the really, I mean, even more than Bowie, I think he's one of the true characters of, of the industry. You know, he's, he's never really lost his spirit. He's always been 100% Nicky. Mm -hmm. Whereas somebody like David Bowie has been, even now, you never really know what you're dealing with with David Bowie, but with Nicky, he's always been a Mm -hmm. you know, so I've always really loved him for that. What you see is what you get. Uh -huh. In your case, though, you're more chameleon like. Well, I mean, I would say that, you know, what you see is what you get with me in terms of who I am as a person, in terms of my personality, but in terms of uh, being able to be a musical style or image, you know, that is constantly changing. As everybody else's image is constantly changing. If you look back at your own, wardrobe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you see that you also have changed. Mm -hmm. It's just that mine is more extravagant probably, more peacock-like, <laughs> and that's always more public. Mm -hmm. But people, I mean, you know, it always amazes me when people say, you know, you change your image. I mean, everyone changes their image. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned your, uh, your your biography a second ago, which we haven't had a chance to see over here yet. It does surprise the interviewer, however, that at the age of 34, uh, 
I guess it's, it's your autobiography. You penned it yourself. Hold on. It, it, it's your autobiography. Did you did you pen this yourself? Or? Yeah, I mean, I wrote the book myself. Oh, okay. I had I had help help with the book, but it's my book. Mm -hmm. My words, my story. She was quite surprised that a, uh, a man of 34 years old would already be writing his autobiography. Well, you can be 60 and have the most boring story to tell. <laughs> somebody why they wrote their autobiography, they would say, well, because I have a story to tell them, because I have one, one book's worth of story to tell. How about in your case, is it just that, or you, you talk about an agenda, was there any particular incident that sort of drove you past the edge there, any sort of I'd love to say I'd love to say that there was some deeply spiritual motivation behind this book, mm -hmm. but it just kind of happened, I mean, you know, I don't really believe in accidents, but a lot of the things that happen, you know, in my life aren't kind of premeditated, aren't kind of planned. Mm -hmm. You know, they just kind of come along. I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to write another book next year. <laughs> I'm thinking about it already. <laughs> mean, mean part two of the autobiography or something? No, you know, kind of like some bits that are missing and some other observations and maybe some other, you know, just some other, you know, like, almost like a kind of, a bit of more of a chatty book, but mm -hmm. observations, lots of different things. Mm -hmm. You, you talk about wanting to set the record straight, and um, I, did I? <laughs> <laughs> well, not not in those exact words, but you. I'm not, not really interested in this book. Isn't written as a kind of answer back to anything that's been written about me. That's not what it's about. I mean, and it also isn't. You know, I mean, you know, you get all these books like My Living Hell. That's not what it's about. It's really a lot of stories. It's about my childhood. It's about coming to terms with my sexuality. About culture club. Handling the whole fame thing or not handling the whole fame thing. It's just a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. You know, most of them are quite witty, some of them are quite sad, but generally it's a funny book. It's just high comedy and high camp. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the dilemma this presents uh, our interviewer with is, is in this next question here, which asks about. Uh, the, the, the sort of suffering that went on in your head during Culture Club, uh, how you had to sort of drag around this big, this big fat public image, and I'm sure you're, you're going to tell me the details are all in the book. Please buy it. <laughs> can you well, give that? Can you give you it? Know, I mean, it's, the thing is that you know what is important to me is that I don't actually sit around thinking about Culture Club at all. Uh -huh. And a lot of people try to portray me as this kind of tragic Norma Desmond figure that somehow hasn't kind of managed to kind of come to grips with not being culture club and not being Boy George. And I've stopped being that person, you know, that kind of image, that persona, a long, long time ago. You know, um, so if anything, you know, the, the great thing about this book is that, you know, it'll be like a kind of encyclopedia for all those questions about <laughs> heroin, about John Moss, about Marilyn and culture club. And hopefully I'll just be able to get on with my life, which I've been doing anyway. Right. But you know, it's interesting, I just, I was just looking at an interview in the Times with David Bowie, and all it talks about is the guitar does. I mean, please, you know, I know more about David Bowie than the interviewer. But it's like, I think, you know, I mean, I was reading also an 
started with Laura McCall and she said everyone ever talks about Humphrey Bogart. Mm -hmm. Maybe it just never stops. Maybe even when you write about it, you know, and talk about it, you're purple in the face. Maybe it just never ever goes away. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a cosmic joke, who knows? <laughs> well, those of us on viewing your life from the, uh, the sidelines are going to assume that that was a, a high point in your life in certain ways and a low point in your life in certain ways. Well, you know, life is difficult once you accept that. You know, once you accept that there are always going to be down points, down moments, you know, and there are always going to be up moments. I mean, that is just an everyday life for everybody. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when you're in the public eye, it's a little bit more extreme. And there are different pressures. But, you know, basically everybody has good days and bad days, you know. And obviously, you know, when you when you become that successful that quickly, you you are kind of elated. But then also, after a while, it becomes a real pressure. Mm -hmm. You're happy, but, you know, it's like, but you soon kind of get bored of it, you know, it's like too much cake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, well, you, you, you view it in a very philosophical way now, but at the time, I guess you were more obsessed with staying at the top or staying in the public eye? Well, I don't think we were ever particularly, I don't think I was ever particularly obsessed with staying at the top. When you become successful, you don't really sit around thinking about it. You're kind of riding a wave. I'm sure take that on to the really spending that much time thinking, oh my God, I've got to stay at the top. They're just kind of eaten up by it and you're just swept along. You don't really get much time to think about that. Mm -hmm. you, know, in, you know, in the aftermath, it's very easy to have things do you start thinking about as the, the fame starts to wane though? Do you start looking for uh, other sources of satisfaction? Uh, like for example... It's kind of a lead on to drugs. <laughs> <laughs> what, did you, well, you, you mean the, the drugs sort of fill, uh, fill well, in... Is that what you're trying to suggest? No, I, I, well, actually, actually believe, it, believe it or not, I was suggesting more the artistic angle, that maybe you turn more towards your music and, and try well, to... Well, I mean, it depends. You know, when I was 21,
So I guess the, the approach to music then is, is, is a lot more calculated now, a lot more time. Calculate the wrong word. Passionate is the better word. <laughs> okay. Okay. Calculate. Why do you use these words? It sounds so sinister, you know. I mean, to be honest with you, you know, when I was 21, I loved being photographed, I loved being interviewed. Uh -huh. Now I'm 33, you know, and I hated being in the studio when I was 21, you know, uh -huh. and I hated being locked away in the studio. Uh -huh. But now I much prefer to be in the studio involved in the creative process. I mean, I run my, I run a dance label, and that gives me a lot of pleasure because I'm kind of behind the scenes, mm -hmm. and I'm getting to kind of really see how the whole thing works and how difficult it really is. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, I've changed so much. I mean, not only because of my own experiences, but also because of the things that I'm doing now. Right. But I mean. Actually, that would make the, the, the word calculated all, all the much more appropriate because now you know what you have to strive for as an artist or to, to be a commercially viable artist. Well, I'm not, well, you know, what is commercially viable? You know, very often what gets played on the radio has got nothing to do with quality. Mm -hmm. You know, being in the top ten, being number one, has got nothing to do with quality or talent necessarily. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, when you're number one, everybody calls you a genius, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are one. Right. You know, I mean, there's the Birdie song, a genius pop song. It's, uh, I mean, I could list a whole number of records that have been at number one. Mm -hmm. Agadu, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you know that one? No, I don't know. Agadu, do, do, push pineapple, shake the tree. I mean, it was like fucking, you know, <laughs> <laughs> number one. Right. We've had, like, we've had, like, Cuddly Toy, the number one in this country, uh -huh. Mr. Blobby. <laughs> You know, I mean, take, take that. <laughs> well, I mean, they're a little improvement on Mr. Blobby, but not much. <laughs> but you know, the thing is, you know, people always talk about art in terms of how much money you can make out of it or how how many units you're shifting. Mm -hmm. And it isn't always about that. Mm -hmm. You know, it isn't always about that. Great music is always being made. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I think the longer you're in this business, the more up and down your career is. I mean, you know. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. You look at any of the great artists, Bowie, you know, Dylan, you know, I mean, even Joni Mitchell is a great songwriter. She has, she has kind of fleet moments and bits of success. It just, that's the way it goes. Mm -hmm. You know I mean? You know, when you're in the kind of, you know, obviously in the beginning, you, you have your peak period. Mm -hmm. And then everything after that is a kind of bonus. <laughs> well, it doesn't happen. You could have two peak periods. No, but it's whatever you know I mean there's there's different obstacles at different times you know but the most important thing is that you, you do work that you're proud of you know that you are kind of working at your full creative potential that's really the most important thing so I guess in essence then you have turned to your music for as your, your, your source of max, maximum satisfaction well you know I've always kind of been very passionate about music as I said but I suppose I didn't really have much of a belief in myself before and because I didn't have much confidence or belief in myself as a writer and as a performer it was almost like I was half there and half not there mm -hmm. whereas now I realize that you have to put yourself 100% into the project you know you can't be half there mm -hmm. you have to give it everything regardless of the outcome you have to be there, you have to be, you know, working full stop. Mm -hmm. And that is the difference between this record, this record, and anything I've done before, even Culture Club. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in Culture Club I had the luxury of having three other members who took on a large part of the responsibility. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, I have to be responsible, it's my, my job. Mm -hmm. And it's great, I mean, you know, I mean, there's so many things that have changed in my life, you know, it's like I'm much more... I just think a lot more now. Is, is that the consequence of, of growing up or a greater experience or, or what exactly has brought you to that? In my case, it's a consequence of extreme therapy. What kind of therapy? Just normal, you know, kind of cathartic, confrontational group therapy with other people, <laughs> strangers. Wait, you said that's, that's normal. I don't, maybe you can explain that a little bit more. For, you know, over here, we don't quite think of those terms of people going through well, therapy. Therapy, the therapy that I've done is basically group therapy with maybe 30, 40 people, depending on the course. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and basically, it's a series of, I suppose, lectures and debates, looking at the ego, looking at the way that we blame other people for the state of our lives. Mm-hmm. So looking at why we grow up the way that we do, our families, our environment. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of thing that I've been involved in over the last five years, and it's been incredible for me. I mean, really. These are these are all people of different backgrounds, or they have they have similar backgrounds. Everything you can think of: mm-hmm. old, young, gay, straight, black, white. Mm-hmm. You know, hippy, trippy, angry, sad, hysterical. Mm-hmm. Everything you can think of. Every person. Well, for example, what do you do you not do now that you used to do as a result of having gone through this therapy? Well, what have you well, been able to implement? Well, what I will say is that you don't actually change as a person. Mm-hmm. I think you always remain the same person, but what you learn is to deal with situations in a kind of more appropriate and adult way. Mm-hmm. So, I guess the difference now is that I don't blame other people when things go wrong in my, in my life. When I find myself getting angry or upset at somebody, I will turn it in on myself and ask what it is about me, you know, mm-hmm. that's kind of um, uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So basically, it teaches you to kind of look within and, you know, use your power in a more kind of intelligent and responsible way. It doesn't make you boring. I mean, I still have shit fits. <laughs> yeah. You know. But at least when I'm having a shit fit, I can blame myself. Mm-hmm. And I can say sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. You know, it's, it's, it's very basic and very practical, but, it's, but it is very intense as well because what happens is that you kind of open a window. And even if you choose to go back and do the other way, live the way you always have, you never quite feel comfortable with it because you basically can no longer bullshit yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's really the key thing that you, you know, you take full responsibility for your life. Mm-hmm. You know, wherever you are is where you want to be. Uh-huh. Without exception. I'm getting told to wind it up, so maybe a couple more questions? Yeah, a couple, a couple more. Um, how, how much time do we have? Can you give me an idea? Uh, five. Five more minutes, okay, we're going to have to work fast yet. Um, let me just ask, hold on, let me just say, how long do you want, 10 minutes, 15? Is, yeah, there's, actually, there's yeah, quite a few more questions. I think we're... Okay, I'll, I'll just turn off. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, you, you mentioned a little while ago about coming to terms with your sexuality, and I think yeah. there was something uh, somewhere about you know how you sort of came out about being gay, um, although you know it was, didn't seem to be very hard to, to guess. Um, what what was the significance of that? Why did, why was there such a big thing made of it? I guess in the beginning, um, when I started culture club, my sexuality was kind of. I mean, there were times when I denied being gay, but generally, as time went by, it was kind of left in a kind of, you know, what I call a puff of pink smoke. Mm-hmm. You know, it was it was neither denied or confirmed. Um, but as time went by, I obviously became more and more comfortable with that because, you know, I came out when I was 16 years old. My parents knew I was gay when I was 16. The reason I didn't really broadcast in culture was because I was going out with John Moss, who was a drummer. Right. And John didn't really want it to be made public. Mm-hmm. But eventually, as our kind of relationship deteriorated and as John became more and more of a bastard, it just seemed to be pointless to be living a kind of, you know, a lie in a way, mm-hmm. which I'd always been uncomfortable with. Mm-hmm. So I basically began to kind of make it obvious and make it clear. Mm-hmm. But obviously nowadays, obviously, um, you know, I wouldn't call myself a protester, but I am very vocal about my sexuality, and certainly on this album mm-hmm. is the kind of theme issue. Oh, really? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, the important thing about this record is that, you know, particularly in terms of the Japanese market, in terms of any foreign fans, if they don't understand the lyrics, they're not going to understand the songs at all. Mm-hmm. The lyrics are the most 
the lyrics are. The lyrics. That's, that's quite unusual. They are the most important thing. I mean, I'm not saying the songs aren't. The songs, you know, because obviously the songs are born out of the lyrics, but right. the, lyrics are the, the lyrics are the issue here. That's what the song, that is, the, the, you know, the, the kind of the meat of it. Mm-hmm. Well, well the tofu of it. <laughs> hey, thank you for that considerate remark. Uh, the, the interviewer comes up with a rather interesting concept here. She talks about um, very ho what she calls high-profile gay icons, like the Jimmy Somerville's or your Mark Almond's or your Andy Bell's, uh, whatever. Uh, do you share any sort of uh, kindred spirit with these guys? Are you sort of a, a functional icon for, 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 for gay people? <laughs> well, uh, I like to think of myself as a kind of human being first, mm -hmm. above and beyond my sexuality. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, sexuality is a small part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, humanity for me comes first. So, I mean, my sexuality, you know, I've reached a point now where it's almost irrelevant to me. You know, if, you, you know, if somebody else wants to make it an issue, then obviously I'm going to defend myself. Mm -hmm. But I don't walk around with a chip on my shoulder expecting people to, to be, to dislike me. I've reached a point in my life where I just feel very comfortable with it. It's no big deal. It's not better or worse than being heterosexual. It's just what is. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's kind of how I see it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I mean, I think it's very important to discuss gay issues. Um, but then I think it's also important to discuss the environment and politics. Mm -hmm. Discussion, I think, is important for stop. Right. You know. So being upfront about your sexuality is the same as being upfront about any other issue in your Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Tell me a little more about these, the lyrics, then. What, 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 what are significant about them? What should, we, what should we be looking for? Well, you know, the next single, which is called Same Thing Reverse, is really is all about what I'm talking about, you know, it's, the lyrics are very explicitly gay lyrics. Um, you know, it deals with a question that I get asked a lot by straight people, you know, what's it like? What do you do? You know, like, what do you do with another man? Wait, they ask the you that? They ask the you that? They ask you that? Of course they do, you know, what do you do? So the lyrics say, how does it feel? What do you do when he's all alone with you? Kiss him, hold his hand, is it the woman, is it the man? Mm -hmm. Is it twisted, is it sick, Mother Nature's little trick? I don't have to feel ashamed, because in God's image I am made. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's dealing with, you know, your brother doesn't understand how you could love another man, and your poor father thinks we're cursed. It's the same thing in reverse. Mm -hmm. So it's taking a kind of, it's taking the whole, I mean, that song, particular song, I, call, I say in my Bible, I call it my kind of beautiful. <laughs> Why is that? Because it's very, you know, the me melody is kind of very Beatles style, you know, very kind of chirpy 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a pretty melody kind of disguising a, a kind of heavier underbelly. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like sort of a, a bitter retort to uh, to all the, 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 the doubters out there. Well, I mean, it's not, I don't think of it as being bitter. I think of it as being kind of celebratory, really. Mm -hmm. Not bitter, although there are tinges of bitterness throughout this record, you know, there's some revenge, there's some proclamation, there's some confrontation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it deals with all the moods, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, of coming to terms with, 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 with uh, you know, with gay sexuality from a teenager. So then I, I guess there is more than a grain of truth about this, uh, the idea of being sort of a, a gay icon, a functional role model. I guess yeah, well, you know, I mean, make, taking absolutely, but it goes beyond that for me. It's not, you know, uh -huh. when I get up and speak about my sexuality, you know, I'm talking as a human being because I believe that prejudice, you know, is an exclusive. Mm -hmm. Pain is an exclusive. Here's here's one from left field. Are you happy? Are you? <laughs> Am I being interviewed? <laughs> What is a ridiculous question, I have to say. Well, like, I, think, I, think, happy, I, think she, I, I think she asked that because uh, th there is a popular perception that you've been through a lot of suffering throughout the years. Well, I'm occasionally happy. Mm -hmm. I would like to think so. <laughs> I mean, you know, I wouldn't say... I'm a very optimistic person. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I don't bear grudges. You 
know, I believe inherently in the goodness of mankind. Mm -hmm. I'm very trusting. And um, that's kind of how I lived my life, you know, so I would say I was quite happy. Although, you know, there are there, there is a kind of hidden cynicism in me. Mm -hmm. Because I look around the world and I see the things that are happening in the world and that kind of darkens my mood from time to time. Mm -hmm. But generally, I'm a very optimistic, happy person. I would have expected you to say, you're damn right I'm happy, I'm, I'm making a living doing what I love, and, uh, you know, one well, out I say of... That. Uh -huh. I say that, I say that from time to time, but I, I use that one so often, it's kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's kind of obvious, I mean, you know, I get paid, I get paid for doing something that, that is very natural, uh -huh. that, you know, I don't consider it to be work, so, you know, uh -huh. on that level, I, I consider myself to be privileged more than happy. Uh -huh. You've talked about being looking at yourself as a long-term performer even from the very beginning. Was there ever a time when you felt in crisis that it was all going to end? Every time one of my records fails to go into the top 40, I, I see crisis. Mm -hmm. But I've had enough of those kind of ups and downs now to kind of be philosophical about it, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, and to realize that, um, you know, sometimes... I don't know, in Japan you have this thing called uh, Nine Key, mm -hmm. which I'm very much, over the last five years I've been getting into that quite heavily. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, we human beings are just in really bad energies. Mm -hmm. And whatever we do, we're just kind of going against the wind. So, you know, there are certain years when it doesn't matter how creative you're being or how much you push, you just aren't going to get there. Mm -hmm. And as I've studied this kind of astrology more and more, it's begun to really help me, you know, kind of accept the kind of failures. Although, you know, I don't judge myself by how many records I sell. You know, to me, when you wake up in the morning, have your first cup of coffee or whatever you do in the morning, are you happy to be here? Mm -hmm. You know, is it good to be alive? I mean, that to me is success. Mm. If you look at something like Madonna or Michael Jackson, you know, on the surface they appear to have everything. Right. An endless stream of cash. But how many friends do they have? Who can they trust? Mm -hmm. You know, and I really can honestly say that I've got some great friends. Mm -hmm. And people who I can really rely on to tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. To tell me when I'm full of shit. Right. And that is really essential. So, so the genuineness of your relationships with others, I guess, is one measure of, of success, one measure of happiness? I think we take with the ultimate measure of happiness. Uh -huh. Because, I mean, what is life about if it's not about relationships? Uh -huh. not, only, not only with, you know, not only intimate relationships, but kind of global relationships, because, you know, global relationships stem from intimate relationships. Are these people who have stuck with you through the years? Or are these recent uh, acquaintances and friends? Or, or what? Both. Uh -huh. You know, some people have been around forever. Uh -huh. Some people that I've met along the way. I mean, I'm, I've discovered that as I've changed as a person, I've been really kind of inviting very nice people into my life. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't, you know, that, and that's everywhere, you know. Australia, you know, America. I've, I've really got some very nice people in my life right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not talking about in terms of sexuality or anything like that. Right, right. I'm talking people that, you know, I I really can feel comfortable with and have great evenings with and, you know. Mm -hmm. And that, that is really kind of helped me. It, it, it makes life a lot richer. Mm -hmm. What are your greatest regrets as a musician and as a person? You don't do regret. I don't do regret. I don't do, I don't do that. Because I think, you know, it's like, you learn, often you learn more from mistakes than you do from, you know, success. Um, you know, um, and also, you know, my friend once wrote, what, whatever doesn't kill you will make you stronger. Mm -hmm. Which I think is a great lyric. Mm -hmm. who, 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 wrote, who wrote that? Uh, Tara Newley, you know, she's Joe Collins' daughter. What's her name? Tara Newley. Tara Newley. Tara, T-A-R-A, uh -huh. N-E-W-L-E-Y, Tara uh -huh. Newley. Uh -huh. And she should 
No, but he was the daughter of Joan Collins. Oh, the daughter of Joan Collins, okay. She's a daughter, yeah. Uh huh. And only somebody that, I like that can write a lyric like that. <laughs> but I mean, if, if you learn from your mistakes, I mean, obviously, uh, well, I guess I, I guess you wouldn't call those uh, regrets as much as. Um, well, I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying that you have to have tragedy in your life to be creative or mm -hmm. to learn. Right. Um, you know, I mean, I used to believe that uh, you know you have to have drama and tragedy and pain in order to be creative, but I no longer believe that. Mm -hmm. A lot of that stuff is more to do with your conditioning as you grow up. Mm -hmm. That you you kind of grow up thinking that that's normal. I mean, I grew up in a family where there was a lot of screaming. Mm -hmm. So I kind of associated screaming and passion, you know, with passion. Mm -hmm. So if there was drama in my relationships, then there was love. Mm -hmm. He hates me, he loves me. You know, that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. Which a lot of people are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, fucking can give you the delusion of intimacy, and screaming can give you the delusion of passion. Mm -hmm. But the two things are very separate. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to fall down a big hole before you realize. Mm -hmm. so, what, what, what are the big holes you have fallen down? Please read the book. <laughs> <laughs> you asked for that. <laughs> I know. I, I hate when this happens. I really do. I hate to give you who put out a book. <laughs> well, I just, you know, I just don't... It's like, you know, the, the, there, have, there have been so many holes. Right. That I just haven't got time to go over them. Uh -huh. And the most more important thing is that I don't sit around thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really all people need to know. Mm -hmm. so it, you know, it, it, could, it might as well be Doris Day that fell down those holes. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's like, it's done, it's over with, next problem, mm -hmm. next scene. Well, 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 tell me, in these significant lyrics, are, are, are these all based on uh, on your own life or your own experience? Oh, absolutely. Uh -huh. I mean, all, all my lyrics, all my songs always have been. Uh -huh. Um, I think it's more, much more direct in terms of, you know, being intimate. I mean, you know, and there are, most of the songs are either about friends, some lovers, some friends, some friends alive, some friends dead, you know, um, all sorts of things, but it's very autobiographical. Do, do you consider this like a, a milestone in comparison to maybe albums before? I'm really proud of this record. I mean, I can honestly say when I listen to this record, it sounds exactly how I wanted to sound. Mm -hmm. And that is very rare. How, how were you able to achieve this? By simply being completely focused, by putting all my energy into making the record, mm -hmm. by not being distracted, mm -hmm. by not shopping. By not what? Shopping. By not shopping? Yeah, no. Just by being there. We, we went away for five weeks to a residential studio. Mm -hmm whole band, we stayed there, we lived there, we, you know, we, we, we lived and breathed the music for five weeks, mm -hmm. hmm. without any kind of interference and, and any kind of, you know, distraction. Mm -hmm. And to, to ask an even more crass question, I guess the record company is more behind this, this particular album than they have been behind others in the last several years. Well, they're showing their teeth more this time, so mm -hmm. I guess they, would, they must be. Is that because of the quality of the product and the timing, or what exactly accounts for their... Well, you know... As you become motivated, so everyone becomes motivated around you. Mm -hmm. You know, it really does have a kind of rippling effect. Mm -hmm. So even if they weren't into it, they would be because I'd make them. But it just so happens that they are into it and they love the album. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of, you know, it's a, it's a good situation all round. Mm -hmm. and, and lastly, what can you tell us about the Japanese rights to the... Uh, the biography, the autobiography. The Japanese right? Yeah, the, the Japanese, uh, I, I would imagine it's going to be translated into Japanese or available. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so, but I'm not sure. When was it released in the UK? It came out Friday. Oh, okay. So it's just fresh off the press. It's out now. Uh-huh. And did you expect that to sell a lot? Or what, what exactly? Um, I think it's going to do really well. Uh-huh. I don't know how many it will sell. Uh -huh. That rhymes. I have to go, Rob, because there's another guy waiting next door. <laughs> okay, George. Well, th thank you very much for your patience and your time. You're welcome. We'll talk to you later. Okay, see ya. Okay, bye. Bye.
nothing to do with who I am at all. You wanted to get rid of the pop Liberace. Well, you know, I, you know, I mean, a hint of that's okay, but, you know, there's, there's much more to me than that. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, you know, people, obviously, you know, I mean, the thing about the media and, and the public is that they do, they like kind of safe parameters. They like to keep you in the corner, in a box. Mm -hmm. This is what you are, you know. You're a junkie, or you're a survivor, or you're a gender bender, or you're this or you're that. Mm -hmm. And people are multifaceted. There are many corners. Mm -hmm. If you, I, I guess, if we were to ask somebody why they wrote their autobiography, they would say, "Well, because I have a story to tell, and because I have one one book's worth of story to tell." How about in your case? Is it just that, or you, you talk about an agenda? Was there any particular incident that sort of drove you? past the edge there, any sort of I'd love to say, I'd love to say that there was some deeply spiritual motivation behind this book, mm -hmm. but it just kind of happened, I mean, you know, I don't really believe in accidents, but a lot of the things that happen, you know, in my life aren't kind of premeditated, aren't kind of planned, mm -hmm. you know, they just kind of come along. I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to write another book next year. <laughs> I'm thinking about it already. <laughs> mean, mean part two of the autobiography or something? No, you know, kind of like some bits that are missing and some other additional issues. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess sound-wise, rather than more aggressive than before, it's more diverse. Well, I would like to think that all my music has been diverse. I mean, I've never really had a sound. I mean, you think of Madonna, the Pet Shop Boys, George Michael even. You know, they have a kind of distinctive sound. I've always been a bit of a kind of whore when it comes to music. You know, I... I'm always experimenting because I bore easily. You know, I mean, I, I, my idea of music is that it should always be, you know, kind of confrontational and challenging not only to yourself but also to the audience. Mm -hmm. I don't see it as some kind of market strategy. I'm not aiming to kind of please any particular audience. I'm starting by pleasing myself. And then anything above and beyond that is a kind of a surprise or a bonus. So, were it to take it then that you, you already are bored of your, become bored of the last uh, type of style you pursued to the, to the house stuff? Oh, well, no, I mean, you know, there, there, will be, there will be dance mixes of these tracks. I mean, there is a dance mix of fun time. The great thing about technology is that no one has to really be limited anymore. I mean, if you take a band like you too, some of their findings work over the last two years have been the remixes of their records. The stuff that was done by Paul Oakenfold is like a big DJ here, mm -hmm. the remixes. So people are blending the kind of rock element with the dance element, and that is exciting. I mean, you know, there, there are no limitations anymore. I mean, that's... Test. Hello. Hello, George. Go on, man. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, well, that's okay. No problem. Nice to know. Yeah, okay. Uh, George, I've been provided with a list of questions by a Japanese journalist of Rock Magazine. Okay, yeah. well, it's far away. Okay, yeah, so th there may be some inconsistencies, because these are not my questions, but uh, bear up with me. Um, the sound of uh, cheapness and beauty uh, sounds a lot more aggressive, uh, sounds a lot more muscular than the last record. Um, muscular. Yeah, more, more powerful. Um, what exactly is, is this reflective of? What sort of changes have you been going through that can account for, for that sort of thing? Sort of sound? I think the album has more energy than anything I've done for a while because I'm feeling a lot more energetic, a lot more focused. But the album, although there are kind of more aggressive tones to it, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of different shapes on the record. I mean, there's stuff with just vocals and acoustic guitar, there's stuff with 40 piece orchestra. And people seem to be focusing in on, on the kind of more guitar orientated stuff. Um, because I suppose I haven't really touched on that area before. But, um, you know, as I said in my bio, I kind of grew up with punk and Bowie and T-Rex. So, it's in a way going back to kind of the source, going back to the stuff I grew up with. Mm -hmm. uh, and I... but, it's a, but it's also taking, you know, I mean, taking traditional music, but thinking about very other you know, that's the great thing about it, I think. You, you, you touched on uh, your roots a second ago. You mentioned David Bowie. Uh, how about this uh, this cover, cover of Fun Time? Uh, was was, was Iggy e Pop also a, a hero of yours? Absolutely. I mean, Iggy, e, obviously because he worked with Bowie, I mean, that's how I kind of got to know about Iggy. E. Um, and also, you know, people like 
Uh-huh. And then all the people that would slag it off if it was going to get 